We're here at the Tiger Conference, and um, I'm Andrei Soslenko, working for Kyiv Post today. Um, I, I, I want to introduce you to our next guest today. This is Dr. Pavel Felgendauer, Moscow-based analyst in security issues and defense issues. Welcome. It's good Thank to you. it's good to have you here. Rarely you come to Ukraine personally, if I'm not mistaken. And today I have this option no, to talk I, to you. I, I, I more often go to Berlin and Brussels. To Berlin and Brussels. Um, today we're talking about Ukraine and the vision for 2020. And you've been one of the panelists, and you express yourself. And you had a conversation with your fellow panelists over there. I want to conclude things that you have heard and you've said on the panel. So could you could you try and elaborate key security issues that are going to be on the table until 2020 for Ukraine? Well, um, uh, the problems between Russia and Ukraine are not going away. And that's a fact. And it's not clear when they could g even go away. I mean, a lot should change either in Kiev or, at, or in Moscow or in both cities capitals for uh, to find a kind of well some kind of amicable agreement between Russia and Ukraine right now it's not really most likely easily possible at all the most important issue if I'm not mistaken is that correct Russian Russian Ukrainian conflict well, of course it's important. I mean, for, for Ukraine, it's yeah. the, the important. That's, that's uh, the question. Of course, Russia has many other uh, fruit on its, on, its, uh, on its plate. Russia is right now maybe more directly involved in Syria and capturing Aleppo. Ukraine and Donbass fighting has almost faded away out of the Russian uh, Agit Pro picture. So there's a possibility of a renewed um, uh, Azeri-Armenian military confrontation in Karabakh. Because actually, if you see the Russian military Interfox, that's a subdivision of Interfox, each day there are reports of ceasefire violations in Donbass from both sides right. and in Karabakh from both sides. I mean, that's a more or less forgotten war. I mean, not for the Armenians and the of Azeris. Course. Uh, but no one takes it right now very serious, but it can explode and maybe will explode in the ra rather close future. And that is going to be absolutely a Russian problem too. Very much because Russian interest, Russian military stationed in Armenia. There's also Turkey there. I mean, uh, uh, so I mean, it's not only for Russia has other issues. Far East, the Arctic, the Kuril Islands, I mean, what not? That's so uh, Ukraine is important uh, for Russia, and Russia is absolutely the problem for Ukraine. You mentioned during your, uh, your speech that countries would need to fight for resources. and countries Well, that's the prediction of the, well, the Russian general staff made uh, about five, ten years ago that had formed the basis of the long-term threat assessment by the Russian military. And this long-term threat assessment formed the basis of Russian strategy. Because the threat assessment is the most important thing. It's long-term, uh, but it's decisive. And uh, Accepting the, this uh, uh, distinct possibility of the so-called resource wars of the future, uh, the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin, was persuaded to uh, shell out enormous amounts of money. We're talking about up to a already spent something on Russian military reform and rearmament. We're talking about most likely up to a trillion maybe dollars already spent and more coming. That there's a gra grave threat coming up that is going to be either a world war between 25 and 30 or a series of uh, uh, large regional wars. Some of them may be also nuclear. And that Russia must use the time it has to prepare 
and the ambitious rearmament program was initiated against the very strong advice of then all-powerful finance minister and deputy prime minister Alexei Kudrin who said that this is a wrong strategy, that we don't have the money, that now we have seem to have the money. When the price of oil was high, this program was adopted. But he said the price of oil will fall and we will be left on the rocks when uh, uh, we expanded our defense industrial base, hired new men, trained them, expanded the, uh, the factories, bought new equipment, then we move into the period of mass production and uh, procurement, which more or less should happen right now. And we don't, and the, uh, the far price of oil fell and we don't have the money. And this will put us in a very awkward situation because that would mean losing a lot of money just to simply try to terminate uh, and cut. It just can't easily cut, I mean, uh, production because that means your industrial plants that were built and workforce are idle, the factories go into bankruptcy, it's going to be an enormous loss. How many years do you think are needed for these wars to appear in your prediction? Well the idea as they say as the general, uh, chief of general staff expressed yeah. it in a public lecture, <coughs> it was in <coughs> February 13, mm -hmm. Uh, two weeks after the approval of the uh, most important uh, present Russian military strategic document, the defense plan of Russian Federation, Plan of Barone Rasiske Federatsi. Mm -hmm. And this became the uh, official policy of the Russian Federation, approved by an important documents. To change it, it's, it's not easy to change. You have to go through the um, meticulous process of uh, interdepartmental consensus building to make a very important strategic change. So you change the strategic assessment. And of course there are forces in Moscow that do it, will do their best to prevent that. I would argue that those uh, who are trying to change the assessment are uh, American spies and agents of foreign influence who want to leave Russia defendless when the enemy attacks us. But Dr. Felgengauer, you still predict that the assessment, the strategy will not be changed and it will conclude in those wars or conflicts. Well, as I say right now, um, the, uh, they should uh, approve the new uh, rearmament program, the next one, yeah. up to 25. The, uh, the finance ministry says that we don't have the money. Defense ministry, Defense Minister yelled on the Finance Minister. This is a real conflict uh, on a huge sum of money and on the political future, including the political future of Mr. Uh, Sergei Shoigu, who maybe has his own political ambitions. Uh, ambitions. He's not a civil servant, and as most other Russian ministers are, he's a politician. He's in politics since 91, and maybe has ambitions to become successor to Putin. At least he is, he is rather popular in Russia and uh, well, does not want to lose that image. Uh, the, um, a severe slashing of the defense budget and Kudrin says it has to be done or we go bankrupt. Uh, defense ministry is going to fight that and offer for slashing all other parts of the budget if possible but not theirs. And Putin is, is the arbiter. You have to make some kind of decision. Judging. Now it's being pushed over on to down the road to uh, July. But after July, there's going to be a lot of infighting in Moscow, which will affect Russian foreign policy and internal policy and infrastructure building and lots, what not. That means for the general staff, defense ministry, defense industry, uh, the so-called Siloviki, mm -hmm. they would not want, say, a detente with America. Because the the if the threat decreases, that means, well, you have to, you can, then you can cut the defense spending. That's not a really good option. So uh, conflict will most likely continue. And uh, I don't think that it will, they will work, uh, something will really permanently work out 
between uh, Moscow and Washington under Trump. You mentioned President-elect Trump, and um, how do you how do you think Europe should, in security measures, should react to unpredictability of Mr. Trump? Well, right now, most likely, uh, very one is going to be just wait and see mm, okay. to figure out what comes out, who becomes actually the, uh, the defense minister, who becomes secretary of state, what kind of foreign policy will be pursued. Uh, not much in, uh, Europe can do to influence the American decision-making process. At but they can, they can unite themselves in a new coalition or new program, something that is different from NATO, but still have the values of the European Union and, and the, you know, to defend to defend itself? Uh, technologically, that's right now not very possible. There's a lot of opposition to that. Uh, say Britain, uh, the, uh, most likely the strongest military power, or equal with France, or maybe even stronger as military power in Europe, uh, doesn't believe in any kind of European defense, and they're, of course, leaving the European Union and don't want a kind of European defense, joint defense as an alternative to NATO. Then in France there's going to be a presidential election which most likely will bring to power a pro-Russian nationalist. All right. Of some kind of sort. Either one Maybe or Maybe Mr. Fillon, yes. And that's actually what Russia wants. It wants to weaken transatlantic links. That's traditional Russian policy. Uh, kind of Finlandize Europe. And if Europe wants to talk about uh, separate uh, defense, well, let it. If, uh, as long as this weakens transatlantic connection, that works for Moscow. Well, that depends, of course, because I mean, Europe is a, a, has a democratic system. And in the last resort, it's what the people believe in. Uh, not ma all many Europeans really believe that Russia is an immediate threat at least not those who don't border Russia. Uh, if uh, the Russian perceived threat will be, if Russian threat will be perceived as more serious, maybe there'll be some more support for more spending, or maybe not. Let's go for Kaliningrad. Recently, and you know that for sure, we've talked about that on, on, on the conference itself, on your panel, uh, Russians moved, uh, moved more, more of missiles, different types of missiles into Kaliningrad. What does it mean? What kind of threat now is possessed to Europe? <coughs> well, there was a rearmament. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a missile brigade, missile rocket brigade in Kaliningrad and Chernyakhovsk uh, 152, which was previously armed with uh, .u ballistic missiles. And now these Tochku ballistic missiles are replaced by new Iskander missiles, which are more or less the same in all their cap capabilities, but have a much bigger range. Uh, officially 500 kilometers, I believe a bit, even a bit more as ballistic version. And uh, obviously much more because uh, in uh, cruise missile version because these can they're the same launchers, more or less the same launchers, can also launch cruise missiles. Can they possess uh, atomic or nuclear power? Well, uh, both. Uh, uh, Tochko and uh, Iskander are nuclear capable, of course. Uh, so this was a kind of planned replacement because Tochko U is phased out, it's not produced anymore. Okay. And it's replaced by Iskander in different parts of Russia. Not in the Far the East, in, uh, in uh, Novosibirsk, I don't know, in all over the, p the, uh, the entire military is being replaced. Of course, in both, most places, these are army brigades. But in Kaliningrad, it's a special situation. Uh, it's uh, these um, uh, missile brigade and other brig army brigades in Kaliningrad are considered um, uh, Navy. Okay. They are coastal defense because Kaliningrad is formed like a kind of Sevastopol of the Baltics uh, where all units are subordinate to the Baltic Fleet Command. 
But really speaking, this is an army missile brigade. Okay. Uh, so these is kind of, I mean, there was, a, uh, there was political kind of talk that in response to Western uh, deployment of the Polish uh, anti-missile base, Russia will deploy Iskander in Kaliningrad. The fact is they would be deploying Iskander in Kaliningrad no matter what happened to the Polish base. And it's still not operational, but the Iskanders are there. Why do you think people and... Uh, uh, but of course part of their important mission is going to be knocking out this Polish-American uh, missile base, which uh, it's now ab absolutely official and I and, uh, said by Putin and many others and uh, Russian politicians and public figures, and I know it as a fact for many years from uh, people, uh, Russian military sources, it's considered that this is not really a missile defense, that this is a, a attack capability for a decapitating first blow. That this base in Poland and the base in Romania, their main uh, target is Putin, to kill Putin in the first surprise decapitating attack. And that's why there are two bases. One base is in uh, Poland to hit Putin in his dacha uh, when, well, he's in Moscow. And the other in Romania to hit Sochi, uh, where he spends almost half of the year. That's really the Russian second capital. It's not St. Petersburg, it's Sochi. And uh, uh, so we should, we should have Russian military explained that to Putin. He believes that, though that is not, of course, true, but he believes it. This is a falsified, deliberately falsified threat assessment. And uh, uh, so we should, Russian military explained, we should have capability to destroy these bases with their silos before a single missile leaves the silo, which will, of course, most likely imply a nuclear attack because silo-based missiles are not, uh, very, not easy to destroy by conventional warheads. And so, yes, the point in Kaliningrad, uh, the Iskanders covers basically all of Poland. Okay. Yeah. There was a problem with Romania, but th that problem was basically solved by the occupation of Crimea. And now uh, deploying uh, mobile Iskanders in the p peninsula, in that part of it where it's Donuzlov, the westernmost tip of Crimea. Okay. Yeah. If Patoria, Donuzlov, there in the steppe, it's uh, under 700 kilometers from the base in Romania. So they can have. Uh, if, uh, well, if they're 500 kilometers as officially under INF treaty, they don't reach, but I believe they can reach. And so that's where the problem was solved. Dr. Felgengar, how do you think Europe or allies like NATO have to respond or need to respond to these, these statements that the Russian president made and also to the fact that uh, rearmament is happening? Uh, well, there's been uh, uh, plans to also kind of maybe increase defense spending. Uh, the British decided to have two aircraft carriers uh, because uh, an actual decision was made in 14 after Crimea. So Crimea kind of forced the British government uh, to decide to, fi a final decision to actually build and operate two aircraft carriers, uh, Prin uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales. Because, and, uh, because there was ideas, maybe they didn't have the money for that. So yes, there is some response, uh, but it's not very well organized, not very kind of, well, serious at least to deter Russia very seriously. Right now, when there's today we're speaking and the opposition is being massacred in Aleppo together with some of the civilian population, the West is doing pr nothing. Uh, that means Moscow would expect the West to actually blab and do nothing if uh, Russia makes other bold moves. Like, say, trying to maybe 
go all in on Ukraine to solve the Ukrainian problem once and for all. What is that all in? Uh, hmm? What is this all in? Well, all in it's a large regional war, which is a possibility. It's not a probability, it's a possibility. But the preparations for such a possibility are go being made. The infrastructure of the theater of possible wars being prepared. And uh, that means uh, that may be somewhere down the road in the future. Uh, it sounds troubling, of course, that they had I so, uh, the, the, we'll, uh, right now the West is uh, disunited and disorganized. And this is going to most likely add arguments to the more, to the military part of the Russian establishment. Who, on the, because of their own internal agenda, do not want a real detente. Do not, I mean, uh, there will be talks with Trump, the new Trump administration. And they'll be talked that we want a deal, but we're going to shift the conditions so that in the end it will be rejected. Uh, with Europe, it's a different story. Keeping America as a potential enemy, but uh, Finlandizing uh, France and maybe other European nations and forming an alliance kind of with them, that's an old idea that's going to, uh, that would go easily be taken. Uh, though again, I don't, I'm not sure that it's going to work out. The pro actually what the West should really do is to recognize that right now, if, if there's no changes in the Russian strategy and establishment as it is right now in Moscow, having a deal with Russia is impossible. But that doesn't mean we have to fight. That means we have to work in the understanding of so-called peaceful coexistence. Avoid major confrontations and wait and see what happens. I would believe that the present Russian strategy will lead to a collapse of the Russian state you as it believe. did last time. Uh, during the Cold War, because uh, this rearmament is uh, actually depleting Russia of possibility of growth and development. And uh, it's, uh, so it's, uh, basically the main thing is to avoid a direct confrontation, avoid local conflicts escalating into an all-European war. So then in the end, Russia is the only country that is ready to use the weapons? Well, everyone uses weapons. I mean, uh, talk in about the use way. of nuclear weapons. Well, I'm not so sure that th this is more political kind. This is called brinkmanship. Okay. Uh, that's a term that was invented by uh, John Foster Dallas in the 50s. It's uh, balancing on the brink of nuclear war. In Russian, it's actually called balancirovat na grani yedzerny vayny. The idea is that nuclear war is so unacceptable that if you threaten the opponent that you're ready to go in and uh, all, all in with nuclear weapons, you make concessions. Uh, the, there are still people alive who use that weapon of brinkmanship very effectively, like Putin's big friend, Henry Kissinger, right. who during the 73 uh, crisis in the Middle East uh, very effective we did that. When the American death and calm went up, I mean, nuclear forces were on alert and airborne un uh, divisions ready to go to the Middle East to fight the Russian airborne divisions. Kissinger came to Moscow and spent several days at a Gosdacha uh, there in Moscow negotiating with the Russian leadership and he so told the Russian leadership, Soviet leadership, that Nixon is a crazy anti-communist and, and each day he gets uh, drunk to the in the evening he's drunk because he consumes lots of uh, whiskey and back to both counts were more or less true and he said the guy will press the button we won't be able to stop him you should make concessions and the Russian did and lost a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, prestige and positions in the Middle East as a, as a result. So now we are trying to play the brinkmanship game. I hear you. Because during the Cold War, Soviet Union had more conventional forces uh, and, and the, United, uh, the United States used nuclear threats. Now it's considered that the West is much bigger economically and basically militarily. So now we're using the nuclear threat. But I don't believe that the Russian military, I mean the Russian general staff, are actually really preparing for a nuclear war. I mean in earnest. They're talking about it. But not prepare. Hopefully. I mean hopefully, of course. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Felgengauer. I hope to see you again in Kiev any other time. Thank you.